What kind of a man is he? I'm a guy who likes to work on my car. What makes a man? Real men don't cry. The man of steel! Real men do not express emotions openly unless it's anger. <laughs> There is no empathy. You need to be tough. I'd show everybody what I think of that sissy stuff. Men are graduating with fewer degrees. Men are dropping out of school. To be a man, you had to have as much sex as possible. Right. You had to beat up as many men as possible. <laughs> If you get hit, you hit back twice as hard. Men are lost in our generation. You don't reach out if you're a man. 80% of suicides are men. The man accused of the city's largest mass murder. The lone gunman continues firing. <laughs> Fathers and sons will be gunned down in the streets because of emotional inaptitudes. A man wreaked bloody vengeance on a woman Is and her killed family. by her intimate Rates partner. of gun violence. Oh, sexually assaulting. The is facing the aftermath of a mass shooting. Stats don't lie, so what is the problem with men? I don't really understand them. It's not that they seem complicated. It's not a matter of greater or lesser. I just know that they are different than I am. I have a dad, a husband, two sons, men close in my life. What are you doing? Look how well behaved these kids are. I have a daughter, too, but I realize my fears for her in this world are different. I fear that she encounters the wrong men. For my boys, the concerns are more unclear, muddy. What does it mean to be a man, to become a man, in this world, today? cheering section watches a couple of three-year-old diaper-weight oatmeal crushers push each other all over the ring. Men and young boys are taught that their highest value is being able to control, to dominate, and to force a situation. I can be, yeah. Let's put our hands together and give a warm, warm TEDx Downey Park welcome to Mr. Connor B. What is the biggest challenge that men face today? I am like a lot of kids in the 80s, the product of a uh, divorced family. I saw my dad once a month. My dad was this like really caring, nurturing man. You know, I really looked up to him. And my stepdad, was this like really masculine, hard guy. My dad's always occurred to me as like two sides of myself. Where are you gonna take the pool? Oh, women, women, My family immigrated to Canada in 1990. We were refugees prior to getting here. From the minute I opened my eyes, there was just war. In the years where I was supposed to be on a playground, we were hiding underground as refugees. Oh, get it right underneath. All the way underneath. I'm in the middle of everything. 
my dad, there was a part of me that just respected and honored him so much. And there was a part of me that was just terrified of him. Up until the age of four, he was in the picture, but then when he left Iran, we didn't see each other till I came to Canada. I remember staying up to like three in the morning waiting, anticipating that my dad was coming. And he was like waiting for Santa Claus. I just want to see my dad. I just want to see him and um, to know that I was safe again. I was born in North Vancouver. And when I was three, my mom and dad divorced. My dad remarried and moved to Seattle. I had a recurring nightmare as a child that I was in you know, a giant earthquake and the world would split in two and I would be on one half and everybody I loved would be on the other. I was a really gregarious, easygoing kid, but still really missed um, that father figure in my life on a regular basis. Thank you for coming tonight. You know, tonight's gonna be really focused in around masculinity and what that looks like. It's gonna be a great conversation. Please give Stephen Mansfield a huge round of applause. We're very fortunate. Hello, everybody. How many of you did not have any substantial teaching about manhood from a, a, a father or a family member? Look at this. I even consider myself to have been unfathered in this sense that my father was present in the home but not active in mentoring me as a man. My father was a military man. And my father was kind of that older generation who may have told me he loved me a couple of times in my entire life. Jay there we go. Good night. Uh, I knew he did. He was a good man. There was not, no major dysfunction. But he could not express his feelings at all. Don't turn off the light. Well, let's just get some sleep. Please, Daddy, leave the light. No, Paul. Fortunately, and I had some good role models in my life. As long as there are guys who can wrestle with him and manage his energy and his, his hyperactivity, um, then, then he learns, he understands, and he's not just labeled as being dysfunctional. We are living at a time when boys are absolutely being traumatized by the misunderstanding of who they are. In the States, there are a group of psychologists who are actually beginning to talk about the war on boys. Basically, the boy crisis resides where fathers do not reside. The number one predictor of dropping out of high school is lack of father involvement. We have a sort of thinking in our schools and our institutions that everybody can kind of march through schools and grow at the same time. More than half of you failed. This is the poorest class I've had in a long, long time. We really have to help school teachers understand better uh, how boys function, how, what, the, how, what they're like at a certain age. Boys push on each other. Boys run into each other. Boys grab each other's books. Boys rough and tumble. The insistence upon them sitting still all day is part of the problem. When these young boys have an outlet for this energy, they get healthy. I went to a Catholic elementary school. On Friday morning, they would have somebody sing the national anthem. Now, I loved music. And every week, I would want to put my hand up, but I would be too shy. Finally, I decided, it's my time. I marched right in the office, right up to the secretary, and I said, I'm here to sing the national anthem. I got up, and I sang with all the jazz and pop tones that I could muster. As I rounded the corner back to class, in front of me stepped the bully. Was that you that just sang the national anthem? So I said, yes, and then bam! He punches me right in the gut. And he says, don't be such a bitch. In Alberta, you know, as a kid, what you do is you play sports. There wasn't a lot of cultural diversity, I guess you could say. There was, there was a lot of sameness, right? And there was a lot of struggling to fit into those sort of confines that were unspoken. There's one particular memory that really, like, stands out more than anything. It was before we left Iran, my dad, he told me and my twin brother we're gonna be men. 
I said, oh my God, okay, like, what does that look like? And not knowing that in our culture, young boys have to be circumcised. He took me and my brother to this clinic or something. This guy comes in and he kind of gives you a little bit of laughing gas. And then all of a sudden this, this pain that you've never have felt, it just takes your breath away. And then my brother screaming, it just burned something in my memory. And I remember thinking being a man means that you have to be in pain. Oftentimes, we are trying to teach our boys emotional resiliency. But what we end up imprinting on them is actually emotional suppression. We need to start with boys, you know? We need to be able to say to boys that, you know, there are things that happen that it's okay to talk about. You know, that old catch cry, boys don't cry, I think has been one of the toughest ones to break with. And that starts pretty early. And what's puberty? Well, puberty? Well, puberty's a lot of things. Mainly, though, it's a time of change. For you, it means your bodies are changing from boys to men. Well, I was told that had something to do with pimples and stuff. Is that right? At about the age of 12, we lose our minds. Adolescence is legal insanity. <laughs> Years ago, I was working in my office, and in walked a policeman who was a friend of mine, and he had my son by the scruff of the neck. My son, deciding that he wanted to test his manhood, had decided to lay in a Nashville street at night and see how close he'd let the cars get to him uh, before he jumped up and ran to the curb. Coming to Canada, everything was different. People told me that I don't have to be afraid anymore, but if I'm not scared, then what am I supposed to be doing? That started us on this journey, I think, of, of finding identity. We were different color skin, obviously. People knew we were different, so they treated us differently. And so we got into a lot of little fights, and my dad wasn't around because he would be working two, three jobs. When you look at world news, it's very interesting that many of our major global problems, especially in the West, have to do with unfathered, untethered, unmentored young men. There's a great African proverb that goes, if we do not initiate the boys, they will burn the village down. <laughs> I think where we're falling short for teaching boys is what is confidence? What does confidence actually mean? You don't learn that in school. I think it was in grade six or seven, I started to feel like I needed something. The first um, kind of Iranian gang started. I saw these guys as men who, who were certain about who they were. There's something about a man that conveys confidence that gets everybody's attention. They had my attention. They had a gang called PP, so me and my friends, we were watching all these gangster flicks. We're like, we'll be the Persian mob. We would take a razor blade and we would cut our arm and then we would stick the flag on, on the blood representing blood and sacrifice and country. We didn't have a rite of passage, so we created our own rites of passage. I was morbidly obese as a teen. I wasn't moving my body very much, playing a lot of video games, eating a lot of sugar. So by the age 14, I was classified as morbidly obese. I was very depressed, I was withdrawn, had a lot of suicidal thoughts, uh, real, a lot of image issues. You know, not feeling good enough, not feeling loved enough, start taking interest in girls. I remember, well, if I only had a girlfriend, you know, like, everything would be okay. <laughs> but how's it get there? You know, not just the sperm and egg stuff. I mean, well, what really happened? Oh, what you want to know about is sexual intercourse. Sex in your teens gives you social standing, right? Like, I had sex at a very young age, late 14, early 15. All of a sudden, I had this, like, inflated confidence. 
because the really attractive, popular girl had picked me. But when it came to dating and girls, like, I had no idea. How do you say goodnight? Perhaps. Don't, please. I use the phrase, be appropriate on a date. I have millennial men who have no idea what I'm talking about. And I might be talking about sexual ethics, I might be talking about manners. So let's try saying goodnight again. I'll call you next week. Will you? Good night, Woody. Night, Anne. When I first say those phrases, they don't even know what I'm talking about. So I'm willing to answer the what do we do kind of question. And sometimes it literally gets down to what's appropriate to touch and not. Part of the problem is we've got to create a safe space for them to ask those questions. The old sex ed curriculum hasn't changed since 1998. Andrea Horvat's NDP say repealing the current curriculum opens students up to problems they're not ready for. You know, my lack of confidence led me to seek out things like porn. Wherever you might be on it about it morally, you hand a boy a cell phone. He now can literally get the hardest kind of porn available. I've sat with young boys at the age of 12 who happened upon what they call slasher films. This is a common a combination of pornography and a woman being killed in the act of sex. 12 years old. He was not expecting that. He just wanted to see breast. He does not have the equipment for that. You know, they're, they're watching these unrealistic videos where, you know, guys are having sex for like four hours straight. The average guy out there is watching these things and immediately is set up to be in a disempowered place. What's the thought that he thinks? I don't have that, A, or he'll try relentlessly to do everything in his power to try and be this, like, sex god. A Frosh Week chant that has now gone viral. He said Turner had no intent to rape the woman the court calls Emily Doe. Moltaup said Turner was engaging in what he called sexual outer course. I was on a college campus not long ago, and I said, well, since about 20% of all females on campus are sexually abused in some way, do you address it in your freshman orientation? No. But to do a, to do a freshman orientation, a university campus with 50,000 students on it, and you're not gonna mention sexual abuse when 20% of the women are likely to be? It's insane. Of course you should talk about it. You're just paving the way for misbehavior and abuse. Marty got kind of sick too, but he wouldn't let on. He was determined to be one of the gang if it killed him. Not everybody's what they seem, you know? For me to, to really educate myself on how to eat better and how to move my body a little differently, I, I had to seek out help outside. And then my parents got me a gym membership. And then fortunately, I was able to befriend a few people there at the gym, and they held my hand and, and really helped me. Sure enough, after a process of about 18 to 20 months, I lost the weight, but I also kick-started puberty, which also helped, uh, you know. Most males, you get that kick of testosterone, and, and there's some good things that can happen as long as you're doing positive things, you know? And so all of a sudden, these, these guys that were the cool kids all of a sudden started to take note. I got invited to things. And I was like, whoa, I'm being invited to, to a party? Really? Me? Like, OK. And you know, there they are drinking. They're doing all that stuff. Hey, do it. And, you know, peer pressure. And I fell right into it because it was that emotional connection that obviously I wanted. And uh, I was getting the attention that I was just starving for. And uh, it wasn't uh, very productive, you know? Like, it was very destructive. After I had sort of failed out of high school, I was totally lost. My stepdad, he said, well, I know quite a few people with this construction company. Maybe I can get you a job. Um, it probably won't be fun. You're basically going to be out in the middle of nowhere in northern Alberta, and it's February. My first shift, it was minus 42. The first month was probably one of the worst months of my life. I was faced with the situation of, do you want this to be the rest of your life? And when I went through that journey, along the way, I learned how to do this. 
pietà rispetto amore. In a conversation with my dad, I basically was straight up with him and said, I, I hate what I'm doing. Like, I'm miserable. He said, you know, when you're a kid, you loved singing so much. Then eventually I decided that I was going to go to a college and actually give it a shot. You know, my family was really proud of me because all of a sudden I was starting to come back to life a little bit. And internally, it started to sort of disrupt this narrative inside of myself that I wasn't good enough to go and do something like that. Those who are unable to avoid chronic overindulgence in ethyl alcohol are usually termed alcoholics or problem drinkers. And so I would be the weekend warrior. Alcohol was just one of them. I had other substances that I abused. And instead of hanging with my family, I would often go out and play golf with the guys. Next thing you know, get home at 2 in the morning and uh, shirk off things because I felt I could. Three beer goggles. It's easy to just mask things, right? We're in a culture of masks. My daughter would have been just about seven years old is when I stopped drinking. And I got to give it all to my wife. She used to ask me a question. She's like, are you being the kind of man that you would want to marry your daughter? And the day that she said that to me for the first time, it was like right between the eyes, you know? That was really the day where I had to take a hard look in the mirror. And it reminded me back to the day when I broke down at 14. With me, with my drinking issue that I was trying to get beyond, a lot of male association of the males that I would connect with is like, oh, sure, yeah, let's go grab a beer. You know, I'm like, no, I don't want to grab a beer, you know? And it, it was a hard process to go through, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, to find that kind of support uh, in a lot of cities today, it, it's challenging to find good, solid male groups of just other males to, to connect with, you know? In terms of whether or not I wanted to have a life singing, it was something that I was definitely questioning. There were some other things that happened in my personal life that really pushed that forward. Throughout that entire time, I'd really been struggling with sex and a, a healthy relationship to it. My partner during university, I was like, Love struck. I fell head over heels. I really cared about her, and I didn't want to go outside of the relationship, but I felt like I didn't know how to stop being unfaithful. You know, I got found out. I think it was the first time in my life that I ever really understood that some actions just have consequences, that you Uh, you just, you can't go back from. And sometimes we make choices in our lives that, without thinking about other people, that really hurt them. And when I saw the pain that I caused her, that I caused somebody else, I really got present to the fact that, you know, I needed to do something different. I felt like I was some horrible person and I just didn't want to tell anybody. So none of my friends knew, none of my family knew. You know, telling people constantly like how great my life was when behind the scenes I felt like it was a disaster. And it started to put me into, you know, depression. I didn't want to go sing, I didn't really want to go do anything. Um, I didn't want to get out of bed. Finally one night I realized I could end things, and no one had to know. No one had to know what I had been doing. No one had to know that I was a complete failure. No one had to know the level of shame that I had carried around and that I thought that I was an absolute monster. No one had to know those things. I could just hide it. In Surrey, a turf war over control of a profitable marijuana trade has resulted in dozens of shootings. So when we were 
you know, getting into little scraps, it was all fun and games. But when fights turn into knife fights and when people start showing up with guns, that's when things stop being innocent and start being really serious. It was here, definitely here. Because I remember this big gap. This is so weird. I can't tell you how this feels. Some things look familiar. Some things are like changed. There wasn't any tree blossoms then, that's for sure. One night, me and my twin brother and a few friends went to a party. As the night kept going on, just kept getting drunk and just things started to get out of hand. People were parked off to the side. This was it. Everybody kind of got into this big brawl and it was just so confusing. Fight happened. Boom, boom, boom. There was like a hundred kids here, like a hundred kids here. There was a car kind of parked at a weird angle. And this guy starts pounding on my brother. And this kid was a boxer too. People are screaming and yelling and bottles are breaking. I remember looking at my brother. He had this big black eye and feeling like, how could you let this happen? Just felt like so ashamed of him and sh ashamed of us. And I'm just like, took this knife out of my pocket. And I just looked at him, I'm like, you have to kill him. You have to kill him. He grabbed the knife out of my hand and somebody on the opposite side screamed, he has a knife. And something predatory inside of me just kind of saw that he was now weak. And everybody else retreated and we ran towards him. I feel like it was right here, like the fence was here. The fences looked like this, they were like busted. I was throwing punches and my friend was throwing kicks and my brother was just doing something. I could hear my heart beating, boop, boop. And then I see my brother on top of him, just plunging into him. And then he fell back, he hit the fence. I, that's the one thing I remember. He bounced off the fence and kind of rolled on the ground and he had blood all over him and it was like, pumping out of him. Then I stepped back and I remember seeing this kid on the ground. He looked into my eyes and he looked into my brother's eyes and he says, stop, you're killing me. And I was just standing over him and I'm just looking at the blood and breathing and I was just feeling like this pleasure, this, this ecstasy, like I have power. The next morning, I, hear, I heard a knock on the door. It was Constable Murray. She said, where's your brother? And I said, I don't know why. She's like, your brother almost killed somebody last night. And in my mind, I thought, what do you mean almost? Next day, my brother had to turn himself in for attempted murder. He was looking at 15 years. In the next week, I realized that we had made the biggest mistake because my mom, my dad, our whole family just broke down. It's easy to lose your way very quickly when you're a kid. And I really lost my way, really lost my way. What about father? What does he do all day? Well, he had a particularly hard job today but he did it anyway, because that's the way father earns money, by doing the job. You pitched really well today, sweetheart. It was very funny. I found out I was going to be a dad. 
and that I'd landed this dream job within 72 hours. And it was almost like my step into manhood was all coming together at one moment. And then almost two years later, I found out that I was losing my job. How was your game, love? I went into a huge depression around losing that job. It took me a while to sort of come to the conclusion that I was feeling so depressed because I felt like I was letting my family down in the most basic way that we expect men to support their families. Without jobs, we had no money. And without money, we could not purchase food for the hungry mouths at home. You do for a living is a pissing match for men, right? How thick is your wallet? If that's taken away from you, then you're reduced to who am I to this family? It was horrible. And the only respite from that was time with my newborn son. So I was an at-home dad for, I'd say, about two years after I got laid off. And interestingly enough, that's always the thing when men say they're at-home dads, right? You'll hear people say, oh, I'm sorry, you must have lost your job. Part of that depression was thinking that everywhere I turned, people were judging me for, wow, well, he's not at work with his child. It's a Tuesday afternoon. What's he doing in the grocery store? This one poor guy at the Safeway. Every time I was in there, oh, mommy's day off today, huh? Oh, mommy's day off today, huh? And I'm thinking, when are you going to figure out that when I'm here to three to four days a week with my kids buying groceries, it's not mommy's day off. Mommy's at work, thank God. Oh. Finish this batter. That was the biggest challenge, was being perceived as a second-class parent. One, I am daddy, hear me roar, right? It was just, don't question that my brand of loving my child is any less important than, than their mother's. I've never met anybody in my lifetime who's ever said, you know, the one thing about my dad was he just wanted to spend way too much time with me. Right, have we ever heard that from anybody? Everybody said, no, like, I just wanted time. Wish dad were here so we could talk it over. Wish dad were here, period. It was empty, it was dark, it was feeling useless. Interesting um, gender stereotype was this feeling of, well, I can't go on medication, I just need to pull up my socks and, and get on with it and, and put on this face for the public. And when men do have the courage to stand up and say, I'm struggling with this, what's the usual response? Poor men. Oh, we really feel sorry for you. Suck it up, Buttercup. And so that, I think, continues to drive men into that silo, right? Of, I've just got to, I've got to deal with this on my own. The impact of emotional suppression and machoism is very real. The consequences are very real. Last year, the World Health Organization released a study that showed that men are four times more likely to commit suicide than women. There's a kind of a discordant relationship between depression and suicide, wherein men are diagnosed with depression at half the rate of women, but they suicide at four times the rate. And we think there's a, a problem there to be unraveled. Mr. Holt, are you all right? What's the matter with you? Who asked you to come chasing out here? Why does a man act like this? So depression, that's in men, often manifests itself as irritability, anger, and overuse of alcohol. In a clinical sense, when we screen for depression, there's very, very little about any of those items. We need a better tool. We need a better way of diagnosing those in a clinical setting. It's imperative that we, that we start to think about depression differently as in, as in a male depression. And we talked to a lot of guys, and one of the things they shared with us was that a lot of childhood trauma, you know, your parents broke up, things that aren't quite resolved, that you don't quite recover from, and then pushing it internally. And then, you know, oftentimes, it would be alcohol that would, would help mask or blunt some of the things I was feeling. What are you staring at? I wasn't staring. Tell me, I saw the look on you. Stop shouting at the boy. Let's get one thing straight. Alcohol is not my problem. Money is the problem. So why is everybody bothering me? When a man is depressed, a man is suicidal, huge implications for everyone around him and family really hurt with that. I just think that we can give people the permission to say, yeah, I've had some stuff that's troubled me. I need some strategies. I have the ability to be able to ask 
and not feel weak by asking and trying to recondition some of that, especially for men, you know, who want to be self-reliant, who like the stoicism. We lost uh, two friends in one summer. Our game's about suck it up. It's about digging it in. It's about being mentally tough. And saying all that, mental toughness and mental illness have nothing to do with each other. You know, after the relationship fell apart, I just took an entire year off. One of my closest friends. You know, we always had this great relationship where we would talk about science and we would talk about music, but I had never really brought to him what was going on behind the scenes. And so, you know, after life kind of fell apart, about a month, month or two later, him and I sat down and I just laid it out on the table. He was very receptive. He said, you know, I still respect you. And he was, he said, because you've been so brave to share all this with me, he proceeded to tell me that he had tried to commit suicide two months before. When they do the psychological postmortem on the suicide, it's almost always about loneliness. The suicide rate among men over 50 is astonishing. You know, I think those years, 40 to 55, are often those years where you might be struggling a little bit around some of the issues of employment. You might not be as connected, right? Well done. Most men cannot name a best friend. I mean, statistically. The one thing I believe to be true is that you cannot be the best man you're made to be alone. I was already fairly well known in the States as a writer when I had a big marital crisis. My marital crisis was a result of me doing anything horribly immoral. It was just a crisis. But it got worse because I didn't have anybody to help me. I had the artificial feeling of a lot of people around me. I had staff, I had employees, I had people I would occasionally go have a steak with. But I was, believe me, alone and dangerous, dangerous. I got through that marital crisis, but when I came out on the other side, I realized I have, I really am not living any kind of meaningful life as a man with other men. It took a while to get there, but it's made a massive difference in my marriage and with my children that I have a band of brothers around me. Probably peace is, is what's mainly there. Nobody's walking alone. Men tend to have their friends, their pack when they're in elementary school and high school, and after a while they just lose each other. And psychologists even have a term for this. They call them rust friends, uh, friendships that you used to have, but now have become a phone call once or twice a year. It's just a lack of skills on the part of the men in maintaining those relationships and making them priorities. Men hit, their, hit the age of 45, haven't had a close friend in years, have no idea how to, how to create that relationship. And they're dying for it, literally. In the winter of 2009, the city of Vancouver was gripped with gang violence. That will impact the rest of your life. But in the Not midst of it all, there was one positive news story, that of Amir Javid, a former gang member now giving back to his community. One night, I was literally crying my eyes out, just feeling so horrible. Like, what have I done? Who And who have I done these things to? How could I ever make things right again? It's dangerous work. He says he's received many threats. But there's also signs of hope, and that's what keeps him going. I work with younger versions of myself. Boys are lost. They don't know where they fit in this world. They have no idea what's expected or what they need to do. A lot of people shy away from being a role model or an example. I, I literally just try to be who I am, and, and that's a powerful message to young boys. They just look at you and they just, they just want to follow you. I don't think it's an accident that I've become such a, a dadvocate is the term I use, right, and really pushing for 
helping men facilitate their own relationships with their boys, not just because it's good for kids, but because it's good for men. So off the top of, this is kind of a lay down of what we'll do today. I want to hear from you guys your due date, of how and where, meaning, you know, is it going to be at home, is it going to be at the hospital, is it going to be a midwife? Prenatal classes, I love them. They're classes for expectant yeah. fathers. And it's really from years of talking to men, things that I know men think about, but if they ever brought them up in a traditional prenatal class, they'd be kicked out. That's Snoogle that really pisses me off. But... <laughs> we have the wedge pillow in our house. It's the, the is it for a wedge pillow? Well, it's literally just like a slice of cheese. It's, yeah. You put it under your belly to kind of support the baby. Everything from, you know, how am I going to balance my work life and my family life? What is this going to mean with my relationship with my spouse? Will we ever have sex again? Just kind of need a chance to talk about those sorts of things. It's about embracing fatherhood and embracing um, their male side and, and challenging them. When my 10-year-old was born, um, my heart opened in ways I couldn't imagine. I think the two greatest influences on how I raised my boys are the absence of a father in my own life and wanting my boys to know desperately, desperately how much I love them and how much I love being their father. And the other thing is trying to be as emotionally literate as possible. Sometimes we, we think that we have to toughen up kids, we have to toughen up boys, but their greatest strength is their innocence. I was taught that being vulnerable meant being weak, but I found that in my, in my greatest weakness, that's where I was able to draw my strength from. I go to a conference every year down in the States. It's called the Dad 2.0 Conference. It's neat connecting with all these dads because they really want to be emotionally connected with their families. And this whole idea of being a strong male that doesn't show emotion and it's very even keel, very stern, you know, this, this figurehead. They're really trying to get away from it. So now when I look at strong male figures, it's the dads that are connected with their kids. Those are the kind of dads that I have the most respect for. It is time to build your brotherhood. It is time to reconnect with the men in your life in a real way, to have the meaningful conversations, to go past the booze and the babes and the blood sports. So now you are in the hot seat, yeah. and we are going to give you evaluation. Thank you. My stuff is minor things, I'm pausing before you start singing, and also do so at the end. Okay. Tone up your emotion a little bit. What if something goes wrong? What would you do? It, it did go wrong. I actually lost my place. So what would you do? I, I paused first right. to see where I was. Take a deep breath. Let the audience catch up. Cool. All right, Toronto, what's up? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Choosing I still love the stage, and obviously that's showing up because I do a lot of public speaking now. So I started an organization called Man Talks, and at first we had a very small event, and it was it was absolutely horrible. But that ended up growing into this movement that's now all over the, all over North America and all over the world. I had this sort of inkling that I wanted to build a business, and we should do a completely separate strategy on getting that video out. 100. Like we should. Together. I knew what it was like to to really feel lost. And I wanted to create something that promoted positive masculinity. Started playing around with the idea of building a resource for guys, like an online resource. Actually, I'm just going to ask you a question. Why does Man Talks even exist? <laughs> really, it just boiled down to it's just men talking, but it's, it's men having real conversations, like real talks. I started to clean up my relationships with people. And all of a sudden, I found that I was having real connections, and that I was growing you know, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. The response is really powerful. We've created a community of like-minded people who are all willing to have real conversations. There is a demand for that. All right, so Phil, thanks very much for uh, joining us on the Man Talks podcast. It's a pleasure to, to have you here. We wanted to give a voice to the guys who are out there making a difference, right? Who we think are examples of positive masculinity like the data around suicide rates. If we can promote positive masculinity, that we will, you know, 
not be able to save those people, but we'll be able to help move the conversation in the right direction so that hopefully they can make a different choice. Dems, come over here. Men have shot? been privileged for a very, very long time. I understand that some of the reticence might be uh, that, gee, why men? And hut! But this is about health, and it's about health in a relational way. If we intervened with men, with a policy that was about men and suicide, and we, we put, it was a policy with teeth that could really make a difference upstream, the benefit flow on to men, women, children would be huge. A, a band of brothers really is, it's not a therapy group, it's not a study group, it is the band of men you do life with. With men, it's gotta be two parts. Yes, on the one hand, you want the man to be vulnerable, maybe a little humble, but I'm not relying on that alone. I want him to have a fierce brotherhood around him. Here we go, you ready? So, come on in. You've gained 30 pounds, you're angry with your wife, you've distanced yourself from your son, you're not just having two glasses of wine a day, you're having five. I know that because I'm in your life, and we're gonna talk about it. We aren't waiting for humility, we're not waiting for transparency, we're demanding it. And that's how men get better. We're the ones who have to fix this and we can fix it. We can fix this, but we're gonna to have to do it together. What does it mean to be a man today? I think it's the capability to love without any fear, just to fight for those who can't fight for themselves, to be a voice for people who don't have a voice. We can all make a difference, you know, just by connecting, because we're influenced a lot by other men in our lives. So if someone opens up and gives you the opportunity, we find that guys talk and talk and talk. Well, our work's already successful. It's, it's already successful in, in that we're here having a conversation. Conversation. It's a place to start. We all have men in our lives. These are mine. I see them stretch into the world full of light and hope I've offered them tools to face what lies ahead. I am optimistic about what is possible. I see connection and beauty. Even if I don't understand them fully, I'm ready to listen.